My name is uh, Jay Austin Huey. Just call me Austin. I work at Engine Yard. Uh, I'm on Twitter. Um, follow at your own risk. I'm kind of a jerk and I shoot my mouth off a lot. Um, and I also organize the local Austin chapter of OpenHack. Uh, we're at OpenHack ATX. Of course, Engine Yard is also on uh, Twitter. Uh, for those of you who may not know, Engine Yard is a platform as a service. You toss up your code and we provision instances for you. Uh, it's a bit different than uh, Heroku is probably what a lot of people know. It's uh, Heroku is a multi-tenant environment. We're a single tenant environment. I'll tell you more about that later if you want to hear it. Let's talk about Rails 4. So let's talk a little bit about what happened here. This launched today. Uh, Rails 4 is out on rubygems.org now. Uh, I encourage you to go play with it a little bit, uh, you know, tonight, tomorrow, whatever. Um, a lot of things uh, have been kind of separated out from Rails 4 and put into their own little gems. They're kind of deprecated a bit. There have been a minor HTTP semantics change. Um, some security features have happened. There's some Postgres integration that's pretty cool. I should also mention this talk is not going to mention every new feature, just the ones that I find interesting. <laughs> so um, going on here. First thing you need to know, Ruby 193 is the minimum. If you're on 1.8, stop. <laughs> Please. Um, seriously, though, 1.8 is, uh, if it hasn't already EOL'd, I thought it had, but uh, if it hasn't already, it's going to very soon, which means no security updates, which means you're basically just standing there, um, you know, at the end of the, you know, the hockey goal with no pads on and just looking at the puck staring straight at you. Um, Rails 5, however, according to DHH's post today, is going to require 2.0 or greater, uh, so you might as well go ahead and upgrade now. They recommend 2.0 because it is faster. Um, so I do recommend that if you can. Uh, a lot of things, like I said, have been separated into their own separate gems, some of which may or may not be compatible with Rails 4.1. We'll kind of have to see how that goes. So use them only as a bridge. Do not rely on them permanently. Just use them to get yourself from point A, wherever you are now, to point B, which is current with current best practices. We're now using the patch verb instead of put inside uh, REST resources. We'll get to that in a bit. Uh, strong parameters is now how we're doing uh, mass assignment protection. I'll go over that as well. And thread safety by default is something that is going on here. So we're going to start by saying goodbye to the bears. <laughs> goodbye, bears. See ya. Anyway, I, just, I, I was like, I, I want funny gifts in this. So I found some. Um, we're going to say goodbye to some features. Um, some stuff that's been removed in 4.0. Vendor plugins is dead. It's gone. Thank God. Use gems instead. Active resource has also been kind of moved into its own thing. Uh, some of the things I read about that claimed that it, they, they kind of felt it wasn't being given a whole lot of love that it really needed. So they kind of moved it into its own, its own uh, project. Uh, hash based and dynamic finder methods, that's where you had stuff like user.find and you passed a conditions hash. That's its own thing. It's called the Active Record Deprecated <coughs> Finders gem now. You can, as I recall, that is a dependency of Rails 4.0. It will not be a dependency of Rails 4.1. So when you start seeing deprecation warnings, pay attention to them and do something about them. Active Record Session Store is also uh, going by the wayside. It just, it's not as efficient as using a regular old cookie. Uh, it's generally not considered the best practice to use anymore. Observers are also moving away. Uh, what I read basically said that they were a, being abused as a dumping ground for persistence operations that were better handled as a callback anyway. So like, you know, after save, blah, blah, blah. Um, and that they were also being abused a lot for uh, cache expiration, which thanks to the way that Rails 4 is doing caching now, which is also why we don't need page and action caching anymore, um, or they've been moved, I should say. Uh, yeah, we don't really need those particular uh, functions from observers, and that's pretty much all they really found that they were being used for. And I'll go into a little bit of detail, just the tip of the iceberg on caching later, but let's talk about the patch verb. This is a, a minor HTTP semantics change. So the hypertext transfer protocol specification says when you're going to send up a put request, it has to represent a complete representation of that object or resource, the whole enchilada. Now think about it. In reality, how often do we really do that? If you have a very trivial problem domain, a very simple form, you might automatically have everything that you know, you've got name, address, phone number, and that's it, right? And maybe that's all you've got. You click submit and it goes up. Well, you just happen to be compliant with the specification by accident, not because you actually were intending to. In reality, with real domains, with real problem domains, we send up only the pits and pieces that we want to change, especially when it comes to other bits of access like APIs and such. So we've been using put wrong. So that's why Rails said, well, let's just use the patch verb instead, because that's the right way to do it. The patch verb says, you know, send me the bits and pieces that you want to change. Now, uh, in 4.0, this is like if you have, you know, resources, whatever, you know, that should be in there automatically. But remember that if you have any specific routes that are saying, you know, here's a put request to blah, 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 make sure to update those to patch, uh, as well as anything that you've got with, um, you know, form helpers, you know, form for blah, method put, change that to patch. Um, Rails 4.0 should work with uh, put as well as patch as a backwards compatibility effort. But wherever you start seeing put and you mean to do an actual update to an object, start changing over to patch now. Let's just get current with the best practices and not worry about it. 
Uh, let's talk a about thread safety. Now, uh, concurrent programming is something that is uh, outside the scope of this talk. It's very, very complicated uh, stuff, and I am far from an expert on it. But I want to go a little bit into detail here because I think it's going to shape the future of the Ruby community to an extent. Now, arguably, maybe even not arguably, Rails is probably the largest, you know, um, known Ruby library out there, collections of, uh, collection of libraries. And they have just shipped this thing today that says config.threadsafe is on by default. Now, what does that mean? Well, see, Ruby has this weird little thing called the global VM lock or the global interpreter lock. They can only execute one bit of actual Ruby code at a time, not multiple ones. Now, you can spawn new threads inside Ruby, and that's cool. But when it actually comes down to really executing that code, it's only going to be one at a time. Now, there are alternative implementations. JRuby and Rubinius, for example, are both engineer sponsored projects, and they do not have that limitation. But the reason this is important is because it sends a clear message to the Ruby community in general that, hey, we're serious about concurrent programming. And maybe, I don't know if it'll actually you know, make any real changes in terms of uh, Mass Ruby Interpreter, the canonical Ruby that we all know and love. But um, it might drive a little bit more adoption of things like JRuby, uh, Rubinius, and uh, thread-capable uh, servers like Puma or Passenger Enterprise. Now, the free Passenger, the one you actually pay for. The bottom line with this is that uh, you have to make sure that not only are you running against an app server that is capable of multiple threads and multiple connections and so on, your uh, interpreter has to be able to do that too. And you have to make sure that all your dependencies for your app, so not only your app code, but Rails, Everything Rails depends on, and everything you depend on, everything in your gem file also has to be written in what's called a thread-safe manner. So uh, that's just something to bear in mind, but I think it's an important uh, signal to the Ruby community in general. All right, we're going to move on about and talk about strong parameters. This is the way we're doing mass assignment protection in Rails now. Before, this is how we were doing it. Basically said, here's a model, here's that are accessible, and here's some params. Cool. We just threw whatever the hell we wanted at the model, and it knew exactly what to do. It was all, it was all good. This is a little bit problematic, though, when you start working on the back end of things. When you have a, a complicated uh, problem domain, when you have a, a big application and a lot of data, every now and then you do have to get in the back end and start fixing stuff. And not to mention development of tests can be sometimes a bit problematic with this. So you know, DHH basically said, how can we get that mass assignment protection? Because it's not optional. We have to have that but still allow for some very easy, very flexible manipulation of the model. And basically, they came up with this thing that they call strong parameters. So instead of what we just saw, picture this situation where we don't even care about adder accessible or protected. It doesn't matter. Nobody cares. Instead, we've moved that protection from the model layer into the controller instead. So think about it this way. You have, it's a web application framework, right? It's not a desktop app. It's not a GUI app. It's not a console app. It's a web app framework, which means you have two possible input vectors, user, developer, user input, can never be trusted, ever. Developer input has to be trusted. So we don't need this stuff getting in our way. So where does it make sense to guard against bad input in the controller? So that's why this has been moved. So what we have here is, here, here's an example. You have a controller, a create action. We're instantiating a new article object. And instead of before, we would pass it params article, right? That's just a straight params hash coming from, you know. Now, instead, we're going to pass it this method. And you can call this whatever you want, but the actual convention is called whatever the model name is, underscore params. Um, but anyway, you basically say params.require article. So inside the params hash, I'm requiring that there is an article uh, hash inside there. And inside that hash, I want to permit only these keys, the title and body key. That is then sanitized and passed to this, uh, this uh, article.new method instantiating the article. Now, if I were trying to hack this and I wanted to spoof, let's say, the author ID of this post, I might send uh, via curl or other means a uh, hash that says here's an article, here's a title, here's a body, oh, and here's an author ID too. You know, I'm just going to make this a, you know, some author, whatever. What would happen is this hash would basically reject that entirely. It would say, I, I don't care. It's going to strip that out, sanitize it, and permit only these keys that I specify, and then have it come in there. That's things like um, you know, other security measures uh, withstanding, of course, but theoretical example. It's basically how it works. Like I said, so why is this better? Because it frees up the developer to work on the data model uninhibited, and it puts the focus on the user input vector, which is the controller. Um, criticism of this is that, you know, I was talking to somebody about this several months ago, and I told him, you know, I like this idea. He said, I don't. I said, why? He said, you know, in, in, in purist theory, we should be able to take an object of any kind and pass it any input we, wa any input we want and just trust and know that it's going to know exactly what to do with that input, no matter what. So this definitely breaks that pattern. Personally, I don't care because I'm looking at the larger picture and thinking, well, it's web application framework. That's you know, how it's going to work. Uh, but that might bother you. So um, just bear that in mind. 
Uh, another thing is that uh, what I, one thing that I read, I believe by DHH, said that he didn't intend this to be a silver bullet, a fix all, you know, something that is going to protect against everything. Uh, so you might need to implement other uh, methods in addition to uh, guard against bad input, depending on what you're doing. Uh, and one thing, I haven't tested this with nested attributes myself yet, but I've heard from others that it can be a pain in the rear end. It doesn't work very well for some reason. Uh, I believe there might be a way around that. I seem to remember something, but I don't know off the top of my head, so bear that in mind. Uh, another uh, thing about, uh, um, you know, I couldn't make an you know, talk about encryption without making an essay joke. Yeah, I couldn't help myself. Um, anyway, so the thing about uh, this is that there, another feature is encrypted cookies. Um, the idea is it's a default cookie store in Rails 4. It's, the, it's a new cookie store. It just encrypts cookies before they go out, decrypts them when they come back. The idea is basically to prevent user tampering. Obviously, don't put any sensitive information in these things. They're cookies for crying out loud. They're only going to support 4K anyway. And uh, yeah, it might annoy the NSA. <laughs> just saying. Probably not too much, though. Uh, default headers. This is something that uh, I saw that was kind of billed as more of a security feature, but I think it's more than that. So these three default headers we see here, frame options, cross-site scripting protection, and content type, op type options, are default with Rails 4. Now, obviously, since they're just headers, you got to depend on your browser to care about them. It's never going to stop an actual attack. But the fact that they're there is kind of cool. Now, there's no reason that you couldn't do this with Nginx or something like that. You know, add these headers on outgoing responses anyway. But maybe you're in an environment where you can't modify you know, Nginx config for whatever reason. That might be a, a good alternative for you. Now, I see other options that you could do here. Uh, maybe you're writing a mobile app, for example, and you want to, I don't know, have a pre-shared key of some kind that uh, you know, when you launch the app, it comes up with a deri derivation of the key and sends that derivation uh, down you know, with uh, every response. I'm not a cryptography expert, but you get the idea. It allows your mobile app to figure out, oh, yeah, this came from the right source. You could do that. The thing to remember is that, to the best of my knowledge, and feel free to fact check me on this. If I'm wrong, tell me, and tell everybody else too, um, that to the best of my knowledge, this is not going to be parsed on each response. It doesn't make sense programmatically or performance-wise. It doesn't make sense to parse this on each response. You only want to do it when the app launches. So if you have something here, you know, another argument that you want to vary on each response, you're going to have to do it on the controller level anyway. But the automatic default headers, if you have something that's just a single value and you want to push it down on every response, you can do it this way. So it's an interesting feature. Let's talk about the elephant in the room, PostgreSQL. Uh, for a long time, uh, Rails community has been using uh, MySQL a lot. Uh, we're kind of starting to see a bit of a love affair going on with uh, Postgres, because I can't really blame it. There's a lot of cool data types that Postgres supports under the hood, a lot of cool stuff that you can't really do with MySQL, at least not without a lot more pain. For example, the HStore data type, arrays, inet, cider, MAC address, UUIDs. The best of my knowledge, you can't really do those very easily with MySQL, if at all. So let's talk a little bit about, let's start with HStore. Uh, basically, this is a database extension for Postgres, but Rails has some cool support for it. You can actually use it in a 3.2 app with the active record Postgres HStore gem now. Uh, and in fact, that's where I tested some of the stuff was one, on one of those apps. Um, if you've ever done a column serialization thing with uh, Rails before, this is kind of similar. Normally, what you would have is a big old text column in a MySQL DB, and you just shove a bunch of serialized stuff in there. Maybe it's a JSON hash, maybe it's some YAML, whatever. Uh, with Postgres uh, HStore, you can actually store it much more efficiently. You can index it. And you can query it. You can do a lot of cool stuff with it that you couldn't otherwise do with a MySQL version of that. Now, talking about those inge indexes, you've got two types. You've got gist and gin indexes. And uh, you should read the Postgres docs to figure out what's up with these. But I'm going to tell you from memory, so if a little bit, this is a little bit off, forgive me. Gin indexes are going to be slower to build, larger on disk, but they're going to search faster than gist indexes. But there's a catch. Gin indexes, the search speed depends on the logarithmic difference in unique words. I believe that's how it's stated in the Postgres docs. So I was writing an article about this. It hasn't actually gone anywhere yet. But I thought, you know, what's a, a good use case for you know, an HStore thing inside your app? I thought, OK, what about user preferences? Let's say you've got an app. You want to have user preferences, and you want to stick those, you know, serialize those you know, HStore-wise. Well, you might have a given a known set of preferences, you know, like uh, language, color of the you know, style sheet or whatever, currency. And you might have you know, maybe, so you've got three preferences, three keys and 10 possible values per key, maybe. So this is why you need to read the docs to figure out which is going to work better for your app. Because in this case, you would think that maybe a gin index would be better because it's going to search faster. Not necessarily. Again, logarithmic difference in unique words. So we've got a data set with not a lot of unique derivation. So a gist search or a gist index might search just as fast as a gin index, but be smaller on disk and faster to build the indexes. 
So you might be better off with gist. Um, the query interface, I feel, is a little bit weird syntactically. That's just my opinion. But you've got, uh, you know, like preferences, at greater than, theme black, whatever. Like I said, this is, you can do uh, the Postgres, uh, Active Record Postgres HStore gem with that now. Uh, the array data type for Postgres, um, you basically, in your migration, say, I want an integer, um, call it this, and we're going to say it's an array. You're going to pass a Boolean telling that it's an array value. Uh, same thing with the string, whatever. And that basically tells Postgres it, it's going to be integer data, it's going to be string data, but we're going to pass an array. And of course, you just use it like this very simply. Give it an array, save it, done. Uh, INET, uh, CIDR, and MAC address, very similar things here. Uh, those are three unique data types in Postgres. They are two unique data types and one generic one in Ruby. So CIDR and INET are both going to be instantiated and come out as IP adder objects, which is something in uh, Ruby 1.9, I believe, is where that debuted. MAC addresses are just treated as strings inside Ruby and uh, in Rails and Active Record. But once they actually go into the DB, they're stored according to those native data types. Uh, moving on, uh, UUIDs. I like UUIDs. Um, yeah. Yeah. All right. Represent, man. UUIDs. <laughs> right on. Anyway, um, I like UUIDs. You, you know, you can use them in a service-oriented architecture, all over the place. They, you know, lots more room. Uh, so you can use these with uh, Postgres. Now, in MySQL, you could sort of fudge the, your way through it. Um, you could store them as strings, but then they have to be indexed, and it can get really messy. Um, whereas here, it's just a native data type. So the first thing you have to do is enable an extension UUID OSSP. Bear in mind, whenever you're running something like enable extension or you know, a create extension command in Postgres, you're going to need to be probably a super user or an admin of that DB, which is not a problem unless you're not practicing good network layer security and or you have multiple DBs on the same server. If you do and you're, uh, you know, you, you, somehow you end up with some kind of a weird injection bug uh, that even bypasses active record, you could end up jeopardizing other people's data if that's the case. But if not, it's fine to just do it like this, enable extension. Otherwise, just like, you know, do a custom chef recipe or something. Anyway, you basically say create table whatever and then pass it an ID argument and tell it, uh, here's a symbol, UUID. And that's pretty much all there is to it. That's creating a UUID. Now, one of the key things to keep in mind here um, when you're doing this is that you've got you know, methods like uh, you know, object or model.first, model.last, which generally depend on the uh, you know, floor and seedling values of your ID field. Well, this is not a numerical value. A UUID is not a numerical value at all. You can't really do it that way. So you might want to introduce a default scope in your model that says order by created at ascending. So you get a chronologically first, chronologically last when you call those methods. Otherwise, it could break. All right, let's talk a little bit about Turbolinks. It's a cool little JavaScript feature. Um, the idea is they want to speed up the client-side execution, the client-side rendering, make everything look nice and, and fast, and better user experience for your users. What happens is this is included by default with Rails 4. It's, you're going to click a link, and it's basically going to retrieve that resource from the server and swap out the body tag with what is actually, which, you know, with what should be from the response. The benefit of this is that you don't really have to have the browser go through and reinstantiate objects in memory from JavaScript and CSS. You don't have to worry about any of that stuff. You're not going to have a whole lot of, uh, you know, slowdown from the user's perspective here. So it's going gonna, it's gonna to appear a lot faster. However, that's dependent upon one major factor. How much JavaScript and CSS have you got? Because if you don't have much, you're not going to notice a whole lot of difference. If you have a lot, you might notice a lot of difference. Uh, like I said, it's on by default, makes everything look faster, but beware, it could break some of your JavaScript depending on what you're doing. You might have to have uh, things listen to different um, event listeners. And uh, again, the CSS, uh, or excuse me, the speed improvement is dependent upon how much CSS and JavaScript you have. Uh, you know, I'm always, I'm always amused at how much people rage over new defaults in Rails. I don't know if anybody remembers when uh, Rails put out the uh, defaults for uh, CoffeeScript and SAS. Rails 3 what? Yeah, exactly, right? And people just raged over that in GitHub comments. It's hilarious. Because it's so damn easy to disable. You just delete two lines from two files and bundle. And that's it. You're done. It's gone. So if you suspect that TurboLinks is a problem instead of raging about it, um, just delete it from gem file, delete it from application.js, and type bundle and press enter, and you're done. That's it. Moving on. Talk a little bit about some caching here. Um, like I said, <laughs> uh, yeah, I, that was like the best thing I could find for this. Um, anyway, so um, caching, I'm going to hit just very briefly. 
Uh, so we have this feature called Cache Digest. Now, before you might have had to put a little version number or something into your, uh, your code uh, and bump it every time you wanted to push a deploy that changes the, uh, the stuff that's being cached. You don't have to do that anymore, thank God. Uh, what they do now is they're computing an MD5 checksum of the stuff inside the cache when the application starts. So if the actual content there changes, you don't have to worry about version bumping anymore because the MD5 sum is going to be different anyway. So uh, default test locations are going to change as well. And I was thinking, what's something fun I could put up for testing? And this is portals, pretty much the only thing that came to mind. Uh, you know, you're going to have test models, helpers, controllers, mailers. This will probably be a little easier for you to get in and wrap your heads around than uh, the original, which was test units, test units, helpers, functional. You know, when I first looked at uh, you know programmatic testing, I was like, why the hell does it have to be written like that? Why can't, why can't it be like you know the way it is now? So I think that might help newcomers to testing a little bit. Um, let's talk a little bit about live streaming. This is a new feature uh, in Rails 4 uh, by uh, Aaron Patterson. Um, the idea is to basically stream a response to a long uh, running uh, connection to the browser. Uh, you should be using a multi-threaded application server. Otherwise, you're going to have a single thread locking while it's streaming data and other requests are coming into a Unix socket or whatever behind the scenes there, and they're just going to be sitting there waiting. Uh, so you do want to use it behind a multi-threaded uh, application server. Um, you know, for example, maybe uh, Puma, Pastor Enterprise. Um, Thin may also work. I'm not sure. Um, I believe Thin is invented, not threaded. But anyway, uh, you want to put it behind a uh, non-gil addled interpreter, like I was talking about earlier, JRuby Rubinius, if possible. Uh, you can use this with Ruby 2.0. Um, standard Ruby should be OK. Um, I don't know about the performance, though. I haven't seen a lot of examples of this in the wild yet, um, probably because uh, for a while it was pretty much broken on IE, which is, regretfully, the largest market share browser out there. When this was written, uh, the actual warnings about IE, I think it was IE 9 that was out at the time. Uh, we're up to IE 10 now, as far as I know. So that might not be true anymore. I'd encourage you to test it. But using it's pretty simple. You just include this action controller, live uh, module, and then just say response.stream.write, blah, whatever. Do it inside of a loop, for example. And just close the stream when you're done. Pretty simple. All right, so let's talk about things that are not shipping here. Uh, some people were expecting there to be a background queuing API. The idea was you had stuff like the laid job, rescue, sidekick. And uh, for the most part, they're fairly similar, but there are some differences. Um, Rails, uh, you know, the idea is to take these, I, these uh, things and provide a common API for them to hook into and a common API for you to give your delayed or asynchronous tasks to. And then uh, that way you can switch your back end pretty easily if you want. Unfortunately, that's not shipping. Uh, some people uh, kind of felt that that was a little bit half-baked. So they moved it out to their own uh, branch, their own feature for that. Likewise, asynchronous action mailer, same thing, because it depends on the background queuing API. So um, you're still going to be, for Rails 4.0, you're still going to be stuck with your you know, rescue or uh, psychic workers. We're like and we're not like. Uh, these are two uh, things for active record that we're kind of hope to have. Um, so you could say where something is like blah or something is not like blah. You know, DHH killed this feature. He, he listed several different reasons. He said that it opens the door to things like where greater or equal than, so which would be kind of a pain in the rear. He said they're not very commonly used, and uh, so they don't really need a lot of optimization. And he said that the uh, you know reuse percent signs wildcards felt like an odd syntactical conflict with Ruby. I'm going to go a little fit further than that, actually. I, I kind of feel that where you're doing where you're like and where you're not like, you're usually searching text, and you're usually searching wildcards around it. So what's going to happen is, unless it's very well indexed, you're going to end up slowing down your database. And even if it is well indexed, um, <coughs> excuse me, at scale, you could end up with a lot of uh, you know latency in your your actual query. So it's going to slow things down in production. So when you're doing something like that, I highly, highly, highly recommend instead of doing like that, have a search index like Thinking Sphinx or Elasticsearch ready to go instead, and use that instead of actual uh, wildcard searches in uh, SQL. Some advice for upgrading, very simply, pay attention to the deprecation warnings and do something about them. Don't just let them sit there. Make sure you've got a really good set of tests and really good test coverage. Um, that, that is absolutely key if you want to upgrade safely. If you don't have that, I strongly recommend that you put off an upgrade until you do. Make sure you've got good tests. Uh, take it in stages by sprints. Maybe you have one sprint and you say, OK, we're going to go from no tests to testing 50% of our code base, roughly, you know, arbitrary number. Next sprint, maybe you're going to do uh, new features. Then you do another sprint to get your tests up to date. Then you do another sprint for new features. You do another sprint for um, you know, moving from, say, 3.1 to 3.2, and so on and so on. Uh, the eventual goal being, if you're behind 3.2, get yourself there, because from 3.2 to 4 is going to be the easiest upgrade path that there is. Just a little minor advice there. And that's pretty much it, guys. Thank you.